Welcome guys, gals, and non-binary pals to this week's episode of Buffy Boys, your weekly review of Buffy the Vampire Slayer from a queer, literary, and feminist perspective. I'm one of your hosts, my name is Joel, and with me as always is the other cryptic host. Brian, hi, how's it going? How are you doing? Yeah, grand. Cozy day today, we're inside, it's uh, my lunch break, it is uh, pelting rain down on the windows, and we're here to talk uh, about episode 19 of season 4 of Buffy the Vampire Slayer, New Moon Rising. We are indeed um yeah i like the rain though it's nice rain is good yeah and i think we do tend to be those guys who when everyone's like oh god it's terrible the sun's gone in rain's come back everything's gray and awful we're like haha secret presence yeah no yeah. it's 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 comforting to be inside when it's like gross outside wouldn't be nice to be homeless during uh times of this i just feel bad like kind of feeling like warm and cozy when it's raining um but i mean hey you know more reason to push for social change and shit like that yeah well i think everything we enjoy by definition is like a product of a certain amount of privilege that other people do not enjoy so i think the best thing we can do is appreciate it and try to get other people into a similar position that's it um okay so our bronze banter we have no fucking clue really what to talk about uh we were watching a bit of demon slayer this week which was, um, it's, it's a reasonably recent anime, which is good fun. I've actually been watching a bunch of My Hero Academia. Is that right, Academia? Yeah, th- this is a brave uh, a brave commit for you because we have struggled with how the name of this program is pronounced at various points. Yeah, well, I mean, it's, you see, I, I have read that phrase for years as um, My Hero plus non-English word. So yeah. I've been like... Initially it was Academia. Academia, um academia is academia what, is what they say in the show occasionally yeah. and we would traditionally say academia yeah but i was very confused um because i said it to you and you're like is it not just the I word could be, but I, I, I could be wrong i could be wrong yeah. so you've been watching my hero I don't know. yeah yeah but it's 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 good fun um but yeah you've also been playing a bunch of the halo collection for pc right bizarrely i have been playing halo because you're not a real gamer no, I'm not a real gamer. I never play Halo or any of those kind of classic um, multiplayer online, you know, first person shooter kind of stuff. When I when when it came out, when I was a kid, it was bizarrely seemed almost like a bit too macho for me to be playing, <laughs> uh, and it just wasn't the vibe I was in. But yeah, I'm very much about at, at the moment. Like we're cozy, we're inside in the rain, we're watching silly animes, and we're playing old video games, and that's kind of very much what I'm about. Yeah. Um. So yeah, it's been it's been a, it's been fun. It's like basically revisiting all the Halo games and I'm looking at them fresh and also you can have the option of looking at kind of the modern version or the um, the classic uh, 2001 graphics where everyone has about three polygons to make up their face and everything is brown, yep, um, right. which is kind of a nostalgic. Um, and it's got me thinking as well, like it's kind of like how specifically comforting and specifically home, homey, mm-hmm, homemaking mm-hmm. Um certain memories around video games often are specifically i think for us and um, because like a lot of my you know nicest memories when i was a kid is like oh going over to someone's house to play like resident evil and their dad like getting past the scary bit that we couldn't get past or you know me fastidiously getting every gem i can get in, in spyro yeah um that feisty little uh often i often suspected bisexual a little purple dragon why um, are you bisexual specifically he's incredibly stubborn and he just runs around the place bashing his head off things it just felt apt at the time um so what, what were you wearing what kind of uh video game related kind of childhood memories uh, keep you warm on these rainy days uh yeah i mean to be honest i was probably less of a video gaming child in a way because um my older brother kiron like was always the person in the family who got the new consoles and new games and stuff so a lot of my experiences of video games when i was younger growing up was watching him play video games so he would be playing tomb raider 2 um or final fantasy 7 and you know we are my parents our parents were like bizarre they wouldn't let us play video games on weekdays only weekends um and you're only able to play an hour a day or something and looking back it just meant we sat in front of the tv doing nothing for hours and hours which was slowly melting our brains as opposed to you know playing video games which are actually engaging and like and look at us now we've really spited your parents in that yeah. regard <laughs> so uh but what we used to do is like if kieran was playing final fantasy um my parents could be coming they'd be like no you've been playing for too long and i'd be like oh i'm giving kieran my hour um and connor would my bro- other brother would do the same thing um and yeah but like i mean i had i had a game boy color 
and then in Game Boy Advance. And those are cool. Uh, but even those, I mean, like, I feel like Game Boy Color and Advance, I mean, well, we didn't, I didn't get any of the Zelda games, mm. um, for whatever reason, it just wasn't that family or Mario games really that much. It was all like shitty, like Harry Potter games, a couple of Pokemon games. So it meant that we, I, or I like, yeah, I, I don't know. I didn't feel like I really properly played video games until I was in my kind of like mid teens when I started playing things like Shadow of the Colossus mm-hmm. and, uh, other Final Fantasy games and um, I'm trying to think what else. I suppose I would have played all the Metal Gear Solids and stuff when I was younger. Yeah, a lot of people played Metal Gear Solid given that they're bizarre Japanese military military espionage games. Yeah. People were really, so really odd. into it. Yeah. Oh, I also played all the Jack and Daxter games. I fucking love those. Mm, you do like those. You really like your kind of like collecticon platformers, platformers yeah, kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's cute. I, I always think um, I think big amongst the gays is often, often Pokemon and people like Pokemon. Yeah, they do. Um, I like. I don't I, love Pokemon. I never got into it. I think it's because I, I, I OG fans will remember. I, I literally remember when Pokemon Red came out mm-hmm. and I got that somehow and I had a big chunky Game Boy, a big yellow one and uh, someone stole my Pokemon Red. And really? I, I, yeah, from from the play yard or whatever. Um, and I always think that was the sliding doors moment where I could have been a Poke gay otherwise, yeah. Yeah, well, I mean... Maybe you would have been gay in that universe. Maybe you would maybe. never have turned to the dark bisexual side. Yeah, the um, oh, I I I was about to dredge up a, a very old internet meme there. You know, come to the dark side. We have cookies, but like I'm so much, I'm so much better than that. You're not. Though. Even I'm so much better. Than but you're that. not though. Is a thing. Um, speaking of the dark side, we see a dark side in this particular episode. Uh, uh, is this your way of saying it wasn't very good? No, I'm not saying that. I'm saying that we, we, we this episode, I'm segueing mm-hmm. into New Moon Rising. In this episode of Buffy, we, we struggle with the dark side of, um, you know, Oz returning uh, and also his kind of, you know, his dark wolf nature coming up and also obviously the dark impulses um, Willow has as a homosexual. No doubt. So uh, do you want to kick us off there with a Buffy and summary for the episode? Sure. So uh, this episode was directed by James A. Contner, who last directed the last Iron, the Iron Team. And it was written by Marty Noxon, who last wrote Goodbye, Iowa. Um, and it was first aired on May the 2nd, 2000. So, um, here's your Buffy and summary. Oz returns, cured of lycanthropy, until he smells Willow on Tara and attacks her, and is captured and tortured by the initiative. Willow comes out to Buffy. Adam asks Spike's help, promising removal of the chip. Riley is arrested for trying to free Oz, Buffy enters the initiative, takes the new commander hostage, and frees Riley and Oz. Oz and Willow talk, and he leaves town. Willow and Tyra make up. It's actually pretty accurate. Quite economical storytelling yeah. there. It doesn't quite capture the pace of the episode, but... Yeah, yeah, because a huge amount of it is, is dedicated early on to dealing with Oz's return and the emotional fallout of that. And it's only really, really, I suppose, around the halfway point that we actually kick off and do, oh, Oz is still a werewolf. Yeah. yeah. Watching the episode. Um, what did I think of the episode? I find this a difficult one to rate and a difficult one to review in some ways because I find that it's so... I feel it's very significant in terms of character development. Like, we obviously have um, a a severing of the, the Willow and Oz relationship, a, co- yeah. a real cogifying of the Willow and Tara relationship, and what's surely a seminal moment for this, you know, queer and feminist-focused um, Buffy podcast, Willow coming out to Buffy, yeah. the vampire slayer. Um, so... Because of that, I, I, I think if I was to look at it at more of a distance, it might be like the actual episode itself, if you remove those elements, isn't necessarily that good, or mm-hmm. isn't necessarily that engaging. But all of that in it makes it more interesting for me. Absolutely. Um, I think there's like there's something, to be, uh, there's something about the Oz episodes, the Oz kind of trilogy. So there's, I can't remember, I can't remember the first one, uh, Beauty and the Beasts, is that right? Sounds plausible, yeah. I can't remember which one it was, but it was it was something like that where it was kind of like Oz <clears throat> and Willow starting to explore the kind of like the dark side of of uh, of the werewolf shit, and then there's obviously <laughs> the um, what was it, what was it called the Veruca episode, the Veruca episode, which was called Wild at Heart, I want to yes. say, and then this one, which is New Moon Rising. Uh, I find them all just tonally such a shift from the rest of the season and from the rest of the writing. It's much more kind of like flowery and introspective and floaty in a way that i don't think meshes that well i think there's a underdeveloped nascent werewolf 
a thread to the show which manifests in these episodes yeah and it's of a different tone and if you had more of a balance in the show between vampires and werewolves and like i don't know like a third or half the episodes was yeah, about, yeah. about oz um maybe oz take on longer we've been developing this more were- werewolf pack or something like that um i think that tone would be have more opportunity to solidify but here it's like yeah it's just it's very they're not sure what it's about like we know we know what the vampire thing is about uh, and the werewolf thing is so inextricably connected to Oz that it doesn't have a lot to say by itself necessarily. Yeah, I agree. And like, even the way they use it in this episode to, it, as a way to explore like prejudice, but prejudice, 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 uh, is like inconsistent with the rest of the show. Mm-hmm. Um, anyway, we'll get all, we'll get to all that. So Oz is back, um, which is fun. I mean, like he's he's, he's a great character, and it's it's an interesting note to be able to bring him back at this point in the season um because he hasn't really been gone that long like he left earlier this season yeah he left episode like five or six this season or something like that so it's been like viewership wise maybe three and a half months mm-hmm. at the most um and it doesn't feel like it's really it, like he talks about like he talks about so much about going having gone to tibet and having gone to romania romania which are all very the magic places. happens in romania in this show so true um and it's like doesn't feel like it, you really had enough time to do all that, to be yeah. honest, Oz. Are you, are you lying there? Um, but, uh, yeah, it's it's specifically also the, the last Oz episode. So... Do, do you think, or do uh-huh. you know from your research, whether they knew it was going to be the last Oz episode? Was there ever... Well, it's not actually the last Seth Green episode. The last Seth Green episode is Restless. He comes back in Willow's Dream. Oh, does he? Actually, yeah, yeah. I don't yeah. remember that, yeah. But this is the departure of the character. I'd have to imagine they knew to some degree. Um, like obviously, he's meant to be leaving for a while. Yeah. But I often, I find that the Buffyverse has a tendency to exit characters and assume they will reappear at some point. And yeah. they actually rarely actually do. Yeah, well, look at Riley, who comes mm-hmm. back. Um, late season five, I want to say. It could be early season six. Uh, where he comes back with his wife. Slash, wife, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Partner. Which is like, like CIA partner, whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but the and I think that's a I think that's kind of the the tempo of the show is that you exit a character and then they will reappear at some mm. point, Faith and other people like that. Um, but the yeah, so I mean, like it, it it is the farewell to Oz anyway, mm. to or yeah, the return to Oz. Oh, there's some joke there, isn't there? As in, like you know the 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 cult nineteen eighties uh, Wizard of Oz movie mm-hmm. Return to Oz. Anyway. Grant. Okay. Um, yeah, I don't know. I didn't, I, I didn't love this episode. I liked, I liked the queer shit. Sure. Well, let's, talk, let's look at the queer shit then. So basically sure. we have a very uh, on-the-surface thematic um, discourse happening between Buffy and Riley about um, Riley's supposed prejudice against non-humans. Yeah, um, which, I mean, he, he says, like, demon bad, kill demon, essentially. Kind yeah, of thing. demon bad, people good. Yeah. And um, Buffy being like, you're such a bigot. It's so much more complicated than that. And, you know, to be fair, we you can see where Riley is coming from. Because in this episode, he doesn't know that Oz is a werewolf. He, I, I don't think he knows that Ongi is an ex-demon. Um, he is found that the spike is occasionally hanging out with them and obviously by the end of the episode um buffy he tells him about angel <laughs> oaks herself as an ex-vampire lover or whatever um but he doesn't have a like she, he doesn't have a framework for having had meaningful interactions with insult monsters essentially but also like i mean buffy's approach and like the show's approach to, to demons has never supported this idea that you should be doing research on every demon to make sure that they're not actually secret a human before putting them yeah, down yeah. Like, you know, there was, there have been, like, just, like, kids in high school who, uh, like, you know, your man who... Took some rage medicine. Took the rage medicine and just, she, like, watched Angel kill him in front of her and she was like, oh, it's a shame, yeah. but... What percentage like, of monster do you have to look like before she can be like, I can kill you, it's fine. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, like, I mean, I think the, I think the werewolf is that kind of shitty metaphor within this context because it is, like, part of the time they're dangerous and part of the time they're not. And... Yeah, it's a weird one. I was reading, um, Joss Whedon specifically uh, didn't want Angel as a character in the show um, or didn't necessarily want, like, twisty vampire representation. He wanted straightforward vampires where they could very clearly represent kind of the things that scare, you know, a young woman Mm -hmm. or a young person in the world. 
and and use them as a a good metaphor for all the complexity of that and introducing angel and then further on spike kind of messed that up to some some degree and i you you can kind of see that in the portrayal of of vampires they're supposed to be a a one and done steak and bacon kind of situation where you have an enemy to defeat um and obviously that like the tension there brought brilliant drama in season two with the angel conversations and stuff but then like having this situation where it's like on and off oh werewolf not werewolf uh, can control it can't control it it's it's a real dodge metaphor it doesn't it doesn't really work and buffy like buffy's pr- perspective here is not one she continues on with like she doesn't there are some demons obviously that she tolerates but like she's not she, outspoken in this way as if it's obvious yeah uh, and obviously there's some of the her own insecurity but it, it's very you know um, you know, all my love to, to Buffy and Summers, but uh, it's a little bit kind of like a straight woman's burden to a certain degree, where mm-hmm. it's like she feels maligned because she went out with a vampire and he might not like vampires. It's like you're so removed from the center of this problem in some ways on yeah. the, in this instance. There's also that issue there as well. Yeah, it's like, you know, are, what's, which, way is the, which way is the metaphor leaning is you know, this a way for Buffy to learn something about herself in terms of communicating, having to communicate to Riley and, you know, explore her own worries there. I don't, like, you know, is the Tara Willow relationship playing that out? Is it like a concurrent kind of thing? Because they're not equivalents. Yeah. And it draws equivalents there, which in a, in a way that I think is like less than useful. Yeah. Um, but the, there is, I think, I would say that this is, I think the first really explicit queer content in the show was well like between Willow and Tyro was the you know um episode where I can't remember which episode it was now uh where they did the spell anyway and they they had a big orgasm together and mm-hmm. then at the end she's like I am yours etc yeah which um, they have used in every preview for the last like three episodes which or I like so. that's, yeah, that's yeah. obviously why it's burned into my brain so extensively but I think this uh, this one is the like kind of this is textualizing it even further because yeah Willow does actually actively come out to, to Buffy and it's a, it was a really interesting conversation what do you think of it yeah, I, I, I'm actually really interested by it. Um, so for context, it hasn't watched it recently, but she essentially, you know, has a conversation where she says that she spent the night with Oz um, talking, mm-hmm. um, but Buffy assumes that they slept together and she's trying to get get the goss and Willow seems to be reticent. And, um, you know, Willow is like, well, it's a complication, Tara. And Buffy says, oh, it's Tara, have a crush on Oz. And Willow's like, <laughs> no. And then it clicks for her. Uh, and then you have Buffy being a little weird for about two minutes of, you know, just like not really knowing what to say. Yeah, and, and referring then, to her repeatedly as well. Yeah, um, so that's fine, Will. I think it's all great, Will. Tara's a great girl, Will, 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 etc. Yeah. And then she settles down into it. I like it. Yeah, me too. I like it for a couple of reasons. Um, it is reasonably realistic um, because I think that what rings through other conversations is that they, they are occasionally circuitous without being... Um, funny like willow's not trying to be funny but she's mm-hmm. just not you know I, I i i feel a certain pressure looking back 20 years hence with being saying she should just say i'm gay and so is tara um but that's not realistic for the character it's not realistic for the time that the episode was broadcast and i think we have to be yeah. accommodation of that and what i really like about it is that buffy is not initially chill about it yeah that would be bad writing i think yeah because like um even the most uh, well-meaning and well-intentioned people um, kind of don't know what to do with their hands when they're confronted with things that they're not expecting in this realm. Yeah, um, and I- like unfortunately, like the, the the world is incredibly heteronormative, and you know you do fr- frame a lot of your perspectives around people, especially when it's like what they've communicated to this point around their sexual, their presumed heterosexuality, and at the point at which you have to reframe that, like taking a beat is is it's not a bad thing to do i think the suggestion that like everyone's just like oh yeah sure i don't even care lol it's like or that's not... i saw it coming or any of that kind of video. yeah it's like o- often unhelpful <laughs> yeah it's, it's it's like okay well that's a great way to like completely uh disregard the um difficulty of the person communicating it to you um it's a great way to show that you're like I don't know. You're. Um, it's, it's it's a weird one. Yeah. I, I think I think it's realistic mm-hmm. and it's a it's a genuine portrayal. And I think what Buffy says is like, "Thank you for telling me." Yeah, she I does. That's the, she... that's the that's the that's the that's the thing that here is like Willow shared something vulnerable about, her, about herself, 
and Buffy feels feels positive about having been trusted there. Yeah, and I think it's occasionally I see this framed as, oh, Buffy kind of doesn't react well or something to that effect. But in reality, she takes about a minute and a half and then kind of says, no, I know you and this is great. Yeah. Um, and what I like about it, I think as a, you know, I think so many people, um, not maybe specifically with this moment, but with Willow in this season, with this character development, felt such a sense of relief and identification with seeing a queer character in a show, someone who they already have such an emotional connection with. And what I like about how they portray Willow here is like she is conflicted about almost everything about this situation, but mm-hmm. not about this. Yeah. As in she's not talking about how she's so confused and these strange feelings inside of her. Yeah, is she the, certainly, she at no point de- devalues her uh, relationship with with Tara. She appropriately acknowledges that the relationship she has had with all is significant and um, adds complexity, but that never takes away from the fact that like, like she's never like oh well Oz is back maybe I should just go out with him because that would be easier yeah. and like lol this is actually just a something something no there's no there's no, none of that it's there's complexity there she struggles with the complexity to a degree um but by the end of the episode it's become very clear what her perspective is yeah like very explicitly um and very genuinely and believably chooses tara what she has with tara and how she's grown over regressing in some ways to her relationship with us and i i I was very struck watching this episode that if you're watching this as a viewer with no foreknowledge of this situation you could very easily read it as that if not permanently, at least for a period of time she will go back to oz and she'll be conflicted and Mm -hmm. i would be kind of concerned as a queer viewer watching be like oh, i really hope she doesn't to be honest and which is funny because obviously there's like an argument there for just like bisexuality you know that uh, while there can be like a difficulty portraying that that um potentially you know a in a non-valued sense like you know a bisexual character choosing a differently sexed person over the person of the same sex yeah one but, partner over another, essentially. Yeah, 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 is is somehow weighted. I understand that in a lot of ways, in the sense that, like, I think, you know, that kind of lesbian until graduation trope that we discussed before, which is full of like gross lesbophobia, Harmful bisexual yeah. bi- biphobia, and misogyny. Yeah. <laughs> um, is and assumptions about college. Yeah, yeah true. <laughs> is all uh, like wrapped up in there, um, but at the same time, I think. I think what the show is saying here is not only that is certainly not removing the emotional relationship she's had she's had with us at this point, but is instead saying that she actively chooses Tara not not only on a sexuality basis almost, but yeah, on a like you know they have like a very deep connection and she's choosing it. They do, and if we what I think what works well with the relationship is her relationship with Tara is not predicated purely on the gay element and um, because we've seen that Willow takes a more active role in the relationship she's kind of the more confident one she and mm-hmm. um, her initial interactions like for better or worse to kind of attract her to Tara is the fact that Tara sees her as the Powerful. instigator where Oz was always so cool and chill and like the the leaguer in that relationship and gave uh, Willow an element of like potential coolness as well like you know my boyfriend's in the band kind of thing yeah exactly so i think she uh she's choosing all of that she's choosing the not that uh, it's, it's it's just it's really it's really a fascinating moment in her character development because there's nothing about being with Oz which would be bad for her mm-hmm. and he is very except for obviously the the, the wolf rage but uh, in his rational moments, he's very chill, he's very understanding, he, it's all very well integrated, but the roots she's taken with the magic, with the spirituality, or the, the, the Wiccan spirituality, with that kind of awareness of herself, goes with Tara, and they're kind of presented as two fairly equal, but like one is more what she wants, and mm-hmm. I really like that. Yeah, I, me it, too. It's, it's nuanced, yeah. Absolutely. Um, one of the things that we need to discuss here is the representation of the queer content, and it's lacking of like distinct... Of, verbalness so obviously as we all know they don't actually kiss on screen Will and Tara until the body which I think is one of my favorite notes of the show is putting it in that episode an episode which is so weighted and so important um, and have it be such a genuine and not normalized in the in the like normative sense but in a contextual sense um 
Like if I can just add to that, if you think that, but if you know, we've shared a few of the original TV spots for Buffy, and they're so like in a world where one girl fights a vampire, mm-hmm. etc. So that is the kind of thing where the gay kiss would be incredibly sh- not shock value, but like sensationalized. Yeah. And as you say, they've really just when you say normalize, it's just a story beat, which is very valuable. I think. Agreed. Um, so I was reading an article uh, that was by Farrah Mendelssohn, which is called Surpassing the Loves of Vampires. The Love of Vampires. Um, and yeah, she has this to say about the, the relationship. Uh, even given that Oz leaves after killing Veruca, his decision to disappear denies Willow agency. Um, when Oz returns, we can see the same pattern. He decides that the best thing he can do for Willow is to leave. Their emotional life is not a hostage to fortune, rests entirely on Tara's willingness for Willow to make the best decision for herself, although this too is problematic. While it could be argued that Oz simply anticipates the decision he thinks Willow will make, the authors fail to make clear that Tyre is not second best. The blowing out of the candle um, may indicate a happy ending, but it is not the same as allowing Willow full choice. If anything, it replicates the ambiguity and control of the similarly happy ending of Casablanca. So th- that was an interesting one, you know, the, the kind of like uh, having Oz um, specifically leave uh indicates that you know it's it's removing a choice from willow but i think we both read that as willow actively choosing tara yeah you know? no, absolutely i think he he leaves because i think he leaves because he understands that willow has made her choice mm-hmm. um, and i think he is full gung-ho like like if, if we think of the the cause and effect of it he is full gung-ho for staying mm-hmm. and definitely partially his motivation for leaving is because he feels he doesn't have the control over his transformations that he thought he did but specifically he doesn't have the control because of how Tara and Willow's relationship makes him feel about how his proximity to that makes him feel how and how Willow's choices there have impacted his ability to like easily slip back into the relationship so uh, all the choices he makes have to be predicated on the choices Willow has already made mm-hmm. um, and I'm pretty certain she's made she, she's chosen Tara the whole way through the episode. Yeah, I think so too. She's she's engaging with the the weird feelings of being always being there brings up the social complication and um, how to she she like ex- she, ex- she doesn't need to talk to Buffy about about Tara either. As in like she's that's I think very clearly communicating her choice here. Like I mean, she, you don't come out to your best friend to then. Go back to your ex-boyfriend. Yeah, and she's not saying who do I choose. It's really, I think Oz being here, here is, a, is an aspect of maybe even a slightly grieving process where she's like, I've made a choice and now I need to accept it. And I, you know, I, I, that makes it sound like that she's like, has to, she made her bed and now she's lying. But uh, she's, she's accepting that she has moved on from a version of herself she used to be. Yep. Uh, and letting that go. Um. So yeah, I don't think there is a flow of this where she based on everything we've seen so far she turns around and yeeks tara and it's like you know i'm back to like being a groupie yeah <laughs> this is it um okay so one of the other things we wanted to talk about um along with our notes in my uh, my notes here are gay stuff coming out um prejudice oh Roddy leaves the initiative that's good he he punches someone on the way and he just rejects their their theories yeah except generally he kind of has all his character development in some ways clumped into one set yeah. of scenes because I, he, I just I do not like the fucking initiative stuff in the season I gotta say so our problem we were talking about this the problem with the initiative is the initiative intru- so most character arcs most character beaks introduce one maybe two people you have Spike and Drusilla you have Principal Snyder you have the mayor and his deputy Mr. Trick etc the initiative introduces between 10 named and principal actors and like a hundred extras yeah. and the pound for pound quality they bring is not equivalent to that because most of the scenes which are set purely in the initiative are expo- expository expository <laughs> uh, they give information um, which is then used by um, well developed characters elsewhere to do things Yeah, uh, and definitely I like when they infiltrate the initiative i like when spike is trapped there i like all the interactions that they have with each other but the initiative are a blank wall that they're bouncing against yeah and i think that's part partially a problem on the, on the basis of maggie walsh having uh, or lindsey Krauss having left unexpectedly yeah, from the season yeah. i think yeah, ha- having been able to develop that a bit better would have been good but even when she was around i didn't love it as a yeah. 
as a base uh, is for the season structure. Yeah, so like Oz basically, over, like I not Oz, sorry, uh, Riley ha- often has to develop uh, and deal with a lot of stuff in one day. <laughs> yeah, so true. Um, so in this episode, it's like okay, Oz is a werewolf. Buffy's angry at me because I'm a bigot. Um, and then he his entire life has been built around this military career that he's developing, and he tries to break Oz out. Um, and then has to like you know completely leave behind his life but like bear in mind that he is a human person he's not a super soldier he's not a super soldier he's not it's not a scooby in the way that they tend to be outside the normal structures when he leaves the military at the end of this cringingly punching his commanding officer and saying you know i'm an anarchist sir um, he then has to go and sleep in the condemned ruins of the high school because that's his life. He worked for the military and he is now just stolen from the military and gone on the run. And I feel a little bit like that's fine for like a Giles to do mm. or like uh, like an Oz or a Spike. But like he's like he's a normal person who's kind of fucked now. <laughs> so like I kind of respect that, that he's like, no, this is like 100% the right thing to do. And this is clearly a person you're torturing you yeah, know, yeah. by electrocuting. Uh, Oz's nipple to make him transform again and again. That's it. Uh, yeah, and speaking of Oz, the other thing we wanted to talk about was just like masculinity in this episode and, and Oz's representation thereof. Uh, obviously, he comes back having with his Tibetan prayer beads, being able to really stave off any um, anger and being able to not transform into a werewolf, which he then loses the ability to do once he gets uh, envious of. Willow and Tara's relationship. Mm-hmm. Um, so specifically, the initiative say that negative emotions trigger the transformation or reinforce it or make it yeah. harder to maintain control. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what I'd say about that is that, like, it's an odd one because I think it really does... It, it, it's kind of contradictory to a lot of what we've read so far into Oz's character, which is that, like... But, like, it's, and essentially what it says in this episode is that, like, he has some toxically masculine traits, such as... Um, you know possessiveness over your like romantic partner or perceived romantic partner um and aggression thereof Mm -hmm. and like the kind of like excuse of lack of control but at the same time i think he kind of verbalizes that he makes it clear that he's aware of it that you know he says at the end that like seeing willow um, is the thing that like makes him not be able to control things but at the same time like that sounds so much like every excuse anyone's ever given for um beating up the person they're yeah with. yeah so uh, there's only so much we can excuse Oz just because it's Oz but yeah at the same time you know and he's supernaturally compelled but also so are so many people on the show so mm-hmm. in this world supernatural influence is and isn't enough of an excuse depending on the situation the situation but like yeah. that's like any influence really you yeah know? yeah um, I think it, it reaches the limits of what you can do with Oz as a character without having to, in a similar way that happens to Willow later on, explore the agency he does have uh, mm-hmm. in this situation. Yeah. yeah, I agree. And that would be a odd one. Um, and it was also like, you know, hinted at when with Veruca and he patently rejected it. So, mm-hmm. you know, who fucking knows? Um, okay. There we go. So, Joe, do you have any Buffy bits? Yes, yeah, so I suppose one of the small things here is that uh, we we once again I think see another development of the werewolf makeup and it's kind of gone through another slight mm. iteration. Um, it was slightly less of offensive in this episode, I have to say. Yeah, but we see a lot of his hands, um, his long gangly werewolf hands, um, and we also have something which I think was uh, clarified by a deleted scene. Um, but the initial reason why they capture Oz is because two demon dogs or something similar to them yeah. are attack the beta team for the initiative and kill one of them. Uh, and there's a deleted scene that clarifies that Agam releases these to test the initiative and all this kind of stuff. But um, without that, it's actually a weird hanging thread, I, I think, I in the episode. Too, yeah. I think it's missing a line here or there. Yeah, yeah. But no, I think most of my Buffy Bix are actually um, angel anecdotes. I have a little bit for uh, our more our Moorish uh, Cordelia chase. Okay, great. So um, a couple of things I have. One is that uh, Buffy has a crossbow at one point and says that she's going to William Burroughs, the um, the head of the initiative, whose name I do not Colonel care about. Colonel McNamara. I do not care about him, his name. Um, so this is a reference to the author of books like Junkie and Naked Lunch. I've read Junkie. Have you? Mm-hmm. That's... Weird, yeah. Weird. I, yeah. yeah, okay. Um, did a lot of drugs as a man, drank a lot of alcohol, and in his late 20s, when his w- wife was in her early 20s in Mexico, uh, played a drunken game of William Tell with her, with a crossbow, and shot her in the head. She died a couple of hours later. Um, 
there's lots of conflicting reports about you know potentially she was feeling suicidal that you know there are other people in the room who did, claimed or did not claim to be there uh he was jailed for some time but not for very long but yeah so that's the reference there um we get the the potential introduction of miss kitty fantastico mm. which is willow and tara's cat who i quite like um when this all went down the an online message board group people of queer women i believe might be queer people just generally but i think it was queer women sent joss whedon a toaster um with uh, that was engraved because they um because he like went through with the decision to have a uh, willoughby queer uh which is a reference to the ellen show i think i don't i didn't watch much of the ellen show so i wouldn't be able to tell you with any certainty and yeah a couple of points riley is like so willow and oz that breakup was hard eh and it's like you saved her from killing herself during yeah you were like, here man you were, you were yeah, around. yeah. You, you, knew, you know this already anyway that's fine um i find this late in the show it is difficult to keep track with who's met who to a certain degree and yeah, when a little bit, yeah. yeah yeah that's also not that important um okay continuity brian <clears throat> that's all about yeah true do like, you f- did, did kendra arrive by a a, a boat Stop. or by a plane like Jesus we don't Christ. know okay so fashion notes at the beginning of the episode riley is wearing a really awful like top with like a stripe on it um willow when she goes out to look at the moon with oz is wearing the biggest furriest coat ever i think she's worn it before Oz is also wearing his um shirling jacket which i still yeah. quite like both woolly jackets actually yeah, specifically yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Oz's episode, Oz's fashion choices in the episode are very like early noughties, enlightened boy. You know, he's wearing a lot of like grandfather shirts with like half button down things, and yeah, your Tibetan prayer beads. Copy and... a portrait of the Arcus as a young man in his jacket pocket. So true. Um, and oh yeah, Forrest is wearing more massive turtlenecks in this episode, <laughs> which is great. Um, Classic villain wear, yeah. Yeah, so true. And uh, I think it was worth noting that Xander didn't wear anything too offensive in this episode, and I was I was happy for that. No, but the, actually one of the worst fashion choices was uh, Spike when they inf- infiltrate the initiative. He's dressing an initiative camo garb, and it, he just looks ridiculous. He does. Like, he looks so small. He looks small, and he looks like an action figure that has had his head like, repainted to be someone else. Yeah, like, kit, not, he got kitbashed. He did get, get kitbashed, yeah. Yeah. Okay, Um. and Death Count. I think it's just that one demon at the very beginning of the episode, right? Yeah, yeah. The, oh, he doesn't get killed. No, sorry, it's the so the soldier gets killed by the werewolf. Yes, one of the beta team gets killed. Uh, and it's ambiguous on whether the demon at the start of the episode gets killed or not, because... They say you pick him up. He kind of just falls down, but yeah. it's also... Uh, in frame and not in frame so he's 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 hanging on yep do you have a rating out of 10 there joel yeah i would um, probably give this episode a 7.5 tibetan prayer beads okay tell me about that um i think as an episode of buffy it's not particularly interesting i think as an episode of buffy which has significant queer themes and significant character development i think it's quite interesting i think those two things make mesh to be like a pretty okay episode yeah i don't think you can extract one from the other okay i'm gonna give it 6.6 wills out of 10 <laughs> um yeah i thought it was like the, the queer stuff was quite good i thought the rest of it was significantly difficult at times uh and yeah we're kind of plodding forward to the end of the season you know there's it's like should we just get some initiative stuff in there i mean we probably should like, right b- bear in mind that like our big bag for the season so allegedly agam was in this episode yeah like a whole thing we get in spike on site and we just weren't compelled to mention it yeah <laughs> so and also like we, have, we haven't seen adam at per- like fighting yet but, like they're kind of just presumed that they can't beat him yeah but they haven't tried, tried anyway yeah. um and also what was the other thing oh yeah the scene, conversation between uh, Willow and Oz at the end of the episode, I thought was very well written, very touching. And mm. um, she says, like, you know, at some point she'll be walking in Mexico, Mexico in her sixties or seventies, and she'll turn a corner and expect to see Oz. I thought it was very That's touching nice, yeah. and nice, and a really nice send off to the relationship. Yeah, absolutely. She'll come back to men in the end. That's the overall message. Exactly, and that's all that's important. <laughs> um yeah okay should we go for the cordelia chase i would love to do the cordelia chase and um, because this week is another moorish uh, episode of angel sanctuary it is um these really technically a second paragraph in many ways of like the yeah. faith arc on the show and uh we have faith kind of in angel's care actually turning a corner and, and trying to be re- re- rehabilitated or start her road to rehabilitation 
and Buffy coming from Sunnydale to bring her back and punish her question mark. Um, so it's a very, very good episode of Angel, in my opinion. Um, potentially because this is the episode of Angel that has the most number, uh, the highest number of crossover characters from Buffy. Because <laughs> all of the main cast are crossover, Faith and Buffy are in the episode. Uh, and we also have the same three Watchers Council retrieval team who were in um, this year's girl yep. uh, at all um, come to try and pick her up. Um, so yeah, uh, there's actually a lot of really strong character development here. We see the faith is kind of re- actually kind of broken in the sense that she is no longer, I think, dissociating from what's happening. She's like trying to find a way to say sorry. She's trying to, she's not reacting with it to everything by punching it. She's really kind of shook by everything that she's done. Yeah, there's a couple of points. One where she is like, some like she's talking to Angel and Angel's like, Faith, put away the knife because she's <clears throat> unawarely or subconsciously brought a knife with her to the conversation yeah. and then at her point she like has like vivid flashing images of stabbing uh, angel yeah yeah which is not great um which uh, i think echoes um similar imagery in buffy where she imagined stabbing willow at one point i think during season three no that was season four that was in the episode this year's girl oh or, sorry, me, sorry season girl. four yeah it wasn't that long ago actually yeah. this year's girl but what i thought it specifically there's a one point where she's holding a knife in this episode and it's covered in blood and she doesn't know what she gets like really freaked out by it and that of course being a very clear macbeth reference um which is very appropriate because in season three of buffy after she's killed um the, mayor, the mayor's guy whatever his name was alan alan she does have a Lady Macbeth moment where she's washing, washing her, her clothes yeah. and trying to get some blood, n- invisible blood out, which so very appropriate. Yeah, no, 100%. Um, and there's a lot of really, a lot of themes for Faith and for the two shows, which I think pay off here, because we have Angel once again trying to connect with her as someone who has also done dark things. And seeing her as still work saving because of that, and partially that's his values, and partially that's him hoping he's work saving as well. Um, and with Buffy coming along, there's a slightly contrived scene where she ends up seeing them in what is actually innocent, but it seems like a state of undress with each other. Uh, and she's hurt by this. And you know, I understand Buffy's perspective because she's just being brain stolen by Faith. Faith has slept with her boyfriend. Buffy hasn't really forgiven him for that yet. And it seems like she's now come and taken the other boyfriend in her life as well. Um, but there's a, a really interesting friction between Buffy and Angel. Uh, and Joss Whedon and Tim Minear, who had this show, um, have talked about this as being the kind of the growing the beard moment really for Angel, where they realise where the, that the shows have to separate, they have to not be on great terms with each other to a certain degree, and that what Angel wants is different from what Buffy wants because yeah. Buffy it takes a very very long time for Buffy to give up on someone, and when she does, they're dead to her to a large degree. They cross a line where they become less person and more monster, and then they're a threat that has to be stopped. Whereas Angel says that like there's no soul that isn't worth saving, mm-hmm. uh, and Buffy is quite a, a good line where she says, "Oh, I'm sorry, I don't understand this. I've never killed anyone before. I can't be in your club." Yeah, um, and he Angel she just tried to kill Faith though. She does. Uh, she tries to kill a couple of people. Um, Angel refuses to let Buffy take Faith, and uh, Buffy punches him, and he punches her back, and there's like this fracture moment where like they're like completely at odds with each other. Yeah. Um, so I th- find all that really compelling uh, it really makes it clear to me what the distinction between the two philosophies are and we also have a very interesting parallel with Wesley in the episode because he initially wants to you know sees faith as irredeemable as well um, and you know parallels you know as we said kind of Giles after being tortured by Angel it's a very similar situation and eventually helps Angel retain faith because of his loyalty to Angel he's offered his place back on the council which Wesley in season three absolutely would have jumped at the opportunity to betray them. And he actually, I think Wesley, Alexis Denisoff showed the log of growth in this episode in his portrayal. Yeah, he um, becomes the like the much more watchable character in this season of Angel. I mean, like he, he still has his goofiness, but he's also, yeah, he has an ability towards uh, like actual human existence. Yeah. Or human, like watchability. Uh, and there is a bizarre chase scene where the water retrieval team turn up in their attack helicopter. So weird. Um, to try and get Faith uh, and Buffy. Um, but yeah, the denouement is that... Um, they're pretty much torn. Uh, Angel is arrested for aiding and bashing her and is going to be left in a uh, a jail cell to burn to death by Kate. Uh, and what redeems it is that Faith um, turns herself in yeah. and wants to serve her time in prison, which she does. 
um and there's kind of a break between buffy and angel where buffy is like i have this new person in my life and the difference between him and you is i can trust him yeah she says it really spitefully as well yeah um so yeah i, I thought it was very compelling a very yeah, enjoyable episode definitely i liked it a lot too so i would probably give that a i would give that a nine fail feminist gestures i think it's really up there in terms of angel episodes yeah i think it's a i'm gonna give it a nine fail feminist gestures as well but i think significantly i would like to give sanctuary a better nine out of ten if you get me mm-hmm. nine think, plus I, yeah i think i think sanctuary was better fair okay um is that us then i think that's us for this week um hope you're all doing well out there in radio land <laughs> thanks very much for listening to Buffy Boys uh, we hope you enjoyed it if you did uh, please feel free to rate, review, subscribe let us know uh, tell your friends um, tell your tell your what Joe come on tell your you lesbian girlfriend yeah yeah and we will see you next time on Buffy Boys Buffy Boys see ya <laughs> bye bye <laughs>